Part 1. The Prologue. In April, when the sweet showers fall and feed the roots in the earth, the flowers begin to bloom. The soft wind blows from the west, and the young sun rises in the sky. The small birds sing in the green forests. Then, people want to go on pilgrimages. From every part of England, they go to Canterbury to visit the tomb of Thomas Becket the martyr, who helped the sick. My name is Geoffrey Chaucer. People say that I am a poet, but I'm not really very important. I'm just a storyteller. One day in spring, I was staying in London at the Tabard Inn. At night, a great crowd of people arrived at the inn, ready to go on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. I soon made friends with them, and promised to join them. You must get up early, they told me. We are leaving when the sun rises. Before I begin my story, I will describe the pilgrims to you. There were 29. There were men and women, young and old, fat and thin, ugly and beautiful, poor men and lords, some riding, some walking, some who lived good lives, others who were bad. If you want to know about the world of human beings, then go on a pilgrimage. First of all, there was a knight. He was a brave man who had fought for chivalry, truth and honour. He had taken part in wars in all parts of the world. He always fought bravely, and he always killed his enemy. Although he was a famous man, he was modest, sincere and polite. He was a perfect gentleman. The knight rode a fine horse, but his clothes still carried the marks of war. He was going on the pilgrimage to thank God for his victories. The knight's son, a fine young squire, rode with him. He was twenty years old, with curly hair and a handsome face. He had fought well in war to win the love of his lady. He knew how to ride well, to write songs and poems, to draw and to dance. The girls all loved him, that handsome young man. There was a countryman riding with him. He carried a bow and arrows, a sword and a hunting horn. His face was brown and his clothes were green. There were peacock feathers on his arrows. He was a true man of the forest. Then there was an elegant prioress. Her name was Madame Eglantine. She spoke fine French with an English accent and had very good manners. When she was eating, she was careful not to make a mess. What a fine, sensitive lady. If she saw a mouse which was caught in a trap, she cried. She gave roast meat or milk or fine white bread to her little dogs, and if one died, she was sad for weeks. She had grey eyes, small, soft red lips and a wide forehead. Her clothes were fashionable. She wore a graceful cloak, a coral bracelet, some beads, and a golden brooch marked with an A. Amor vincit omnia was written on it. That is Latin. Love conquers all. There was another nun, a secretary, and three priests. Also, there was a fat monk who wore rich clothes and loved hunting. His favourite food was roast swan. Next to him, there was a merry friar. This fat friar loved pretty girls, silver and gold, and singing. He knew all the inns in town, and loved drinking better than praying. These were all religious people, but they loved the world. A fashionable lady, a rich monk, and a pleasure-loving friar. All kinds of people rode on the pilgrimage. There was a rich merchant with a long beard and rich clothes. He knew how to make money and rode a fat horse. But next to him, the Oxford cleric rode a thin horse. He preferred to have books by great philosophers next to his bed, not bags of money. A Franklin with a white beard rode with them, a man who loved good food and wine. After them, there was a cook, who knew how to cook delicious meals with herbs and spices. Then there was a brown-faced sea captain who looked like a pirate. He had fought battles at sea and made his prisoners walk the plank. 
Then there was a doctor who knew everything about the body. His patients paid him with gold. The plague had made him very rich indeed. Look at the next pilgrim. She was a large, red-faced woman from the city of Bath. She wore a huge hat and a long coat over her wide hips. Her tights were red and her shoes were new. Her face was as red as her clothes. How many husbands do you think she had been married to? Five. She had lived longer than them all. That is how she became rich enough to go on pilgrimages. To Jerusalem, to Spain, to France, to Rome. The wife of Bath liked to laugh and talk about love, a subject in which she was an expert. What a woman! Now I will tell you about the miller. He was a great, fat, strong man with a red beard and huge muscles. On the end of his large red nose there was a large red hairy wart. The miller loved drinking and telling jokes, but he was an expert thief who stole corn from his customers. As the pilgrims rode out of town, the miller played the bagpipes. Everyone knew that we were coming. A parson was also travelling with us. He loved God and loved to help other people. He gave money to the poor, gave advice to people with problems, and visited the sick, even when the weather was bad. He was a very good man. But behind him, I am sorry to tell you, there were two bad men. One was a summoner. His job was to punish people who broke the religious laws. The church was very strong in those times, so he had a lot of power. And he used it to make money from poor people who were afraid of him. This summoner had a red face with large pimples. He stank of garlic and onions. He looked so terrible that children were afraid when they saw him. The other man was the pardoner. He had long yellow hair like rat's tails with no beard. Ugh. If people gave him money, he forgave them in the name of the church. That was his job. He always carried bits of wood and cloth and bones, which he said came from the Virgin Mary or Jesus or the saints. He was a liar, of course. He earned far more money than the honest parson. When he sang in church, he had a fine voice, but his heart was black and ugly. There were many other pilgrims, but it will be boring if I tell you about them all. It's time to begin telling the stories. I shall tell you everything about the pilgrimage, but please remember that I'm only repeating what the pilgrims said and did. If sometimes the stories which they told are not polite, it's not my fault. I must tell the truth, mustn't I? The pilgrims began their journey from the Tabard Inn on the south bank of the Thames. Before we left, the host gave us all a great meal. After we had eaten, he spoke to us. He was a large, bright-eyed man who loved to have fun. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I have decided to come with you to visit St Thomas. I hope we all enjoy our journey to Canterbury. I have an idea which will help us to enjoy the long pilgrimage. Each person must tell a story on the way to Canterbury and another story on the way back. We'll give a prize to the person who tells the best story. What do you think? All the pilgrims agreed with this idea. They ordered more wine and then went to bed. Early next morning, the host woke everybody up. Who will tell the first story? He asked. I choose the knight. Very well, said the knight. I will begin the game. Let's start riding towards Canterbury and listen to my story. Exercise 4. Spot the difference. Here is the beginning of the prologue. But listen carefully. There are ten changes. In May, when the sweet showers fall and feed the roots in the earth, the flowers begin to bloom. The soft wind blows from the south, and the young sun rises in the sky. The small birds sing in the green forests. 
Then people want to go on pilgrimages. From every part of England, they go to Canterbury to visit the tomb of Stephen Beckett, the martyr, who helped the poor. My name is Geoffrey Chaucer. People say that I am a poet, but I'm not really very important. I'm just a storyteller. One day in spring, I was staying in Canterbury at the Tabard Inn. At night, a great crowd of people arrived at the inn, ready to go on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. I soon made friends with them and promised to join them. You must get up early, they told me. We are leaving before the sun rises. Before I begin my story, I will describe the pilgrims to you. There were thirty-nine. There were men and women and children, young and old, fat and thin, ugly and beautiful, poor men and lords, some riding, some walking, some who lived good lives, others who were bad. If you want to know about religion, then go on a pilgrimage. First of all, there was a knight. He was a brave man who had fought for chivalry, truth, and honour. He had taken part in wars in all parts of England. He always fought bravely, and he always killed his enemy. Although he was a famous man, he was modest, sincere, and polite. He was a perfect gentleman. Part 2 The Knight's Tale Palamon and Arcite were two cousins who lived in the Greek city of Thebes. The king of Thebes, Creon, was an old, wicked man who treated his enemies very badly. Theseus, the Duke of Athens, met a group of women as he was travelling. They were crying. Help us, Lord Theseus. We are all widows. Creon has murdered our husbands. Theseus decided to attack Thebes. He sent his wife, Hippolyta, and her sister, Emily, to his palace where they would be safe. Then he marched towards Thebes with his soldiers. Palamon and Arcite fought bravely to defend their city, but in the end they fell unconscious to the ground. The victorious soldiers of Athens walked among the dead bodies on the battlefield. Come here! shouted the soldier. These two are still breathing. They're alive. It was Palamon and Arcite. Theseus took the two young men prisoner. He took them back to Athens and locked them in a tall, dark tower. No gold could buy their freedom. They were prisoners for life. One morning in May, Emily, the sister of Queen Hippolyta, was walking in the garden near the tower. She was as beautiful as the lilies and roses that grew there. She sang like an angel. Palamon, who was looking sadly out of the window, cried out when he saw her. Oh. An arrow had gone through his heart. He had fallen in love. Arcite heard him shout. He also came to the window and looked out through the thick iron bars. As soon as he saw Emily, he also lost his heart to her. They were both in love with the same woman. Palamon was angry with Arcite. You are my friend and my cousin. When we were children, we promised that we would always help each other. Now you have betrayed me. You are in love with my lady. I love her more than you, replied Arcite. I am right to love her. There is no law in love. But let's stop quarrelling. We are both prisoners. She will never marry either of us. Every day the two cousins with burning hearts looked through the bars and watched her walking in the garden. Shortly after this, a duke from Thebes came to visit Duke Theseus. This visitor was a friend of Arcite and begged Theseus to release him from prison. I will pay you money, he said. Duke Theseus spoke sternly. I agree to let him go. But there is one condition. Arcite must leave Athens immediately. If he ever returns, he will die. 
So Arsid received his freedom, but had to return to Thebes while Palamon remained in the tower all alone. Arsid was very unhappy. I am free, but I cannot see the lovely Emily. Palamon is far luckier than I am. Every day he can look out of his window and watch her walking in the garden. He is in paradise. Palamon was equally unhappy. Arsid is far luckier than I am. He can collect a great army in Thebes and march against Athens. If he wins the war against Theseus, he can marry Emily. He is in paradise. Arsid, however, had a different plan. He came back secretly to Athens. He looked pale and sick because he had been suffering for so long from a broken heart. Nobody recognized him. He took off his lord's clothes and put on the clothes of a poor man. Then he went to the house of Lady Emily. My name is Philostrate, he told the servants. I am looking for a job. He was a strong, hard-working young man, so he was given a job. Arsid became the personal servant of Lady Emily. But if anyone recognized him, he would die. Palamon was in the tower for seven years. One day, however, a friend helped him to escape. He gave the guard a glass of wine with drugs in it that made him sleep. Then Palamon ran away. He crept through Athens in the middle of the night and reached the countryside where he hid in a grove. Both lovers were now free. It was May. All the fields were green, the flowers were brightly coloured and the birds were singing. Thinking about his love for Emily, Arsid rode into the countryside. I am in a terrible situation, he said aloud, thinking that no one was listening. I cannot use my real name. I am only a servant to the lady that I want to make my wife. Palamon was hiding nearby in the forest. When he heard Arsid, he was very angry and rushed towards him. Emily is mine, he shouted. You must not love her. You are a lunatic for love, said Arsid. The two cousins began fighting like a lion and a tiger in the forest until they were standing in a river of blood. On the same day, Theseus woke up early in his palace in the city. It is a clear, bright day. We will go hunting, he decided. He rode out into the countryside with Hippolyta, his lovely queen, and her sister Emily. Suddenly, he saw two men fighting like animals in the middle of the forest. Stop! he shouted. Who are you? I am Palamon, replied one. I deserve to die. I have escaped from your prison. But this is Arsit. He also deserves to die. He has returned to Athens from Thebes under the name of Philostrate. We are fighting because we both love the Lady Emily. Kill us both at the same time. Yes, you deserve to die, said Theseus. You are the enemies of Athens. But Emily and her ladies begged Theseus not to kill them. They are young, handsome men from good families. Forgive them. Theseus thought carefully. A good king must not be angry. He must be calm. And wise. The god of love is very powerful. Instead of escaping to Thebes, Palamon and Arsit stayed here because they loved you, Emily, even though you didn't know anything about their love. I was a lover when I was young. I have also done stupid things for love. I will let them live. He turned to Palamon and Arsit. Only one of you can marry my sister-in-law. Go away and collect a hundred knights each. In a year's time, return to Athens. Your two armies will fight, and the winner will be the husband of Emily. The two cousins were very happy. They knelt in front of Theseus and thanked him. Then they returned as quickly as possible to Thebes. A year later... They came back to Athens. Each rode at the head of a hundred knights. The people of Athens came out into the streets to watch. Arsit prayed to Mars, the god of war, and Palamon prayed for the help of Venus, the goddess of love. 
Arsit's men carried the red flag of Mars, and Palamon's men carried the white flag of Venus. The fighting lasted from morning until night, but finally Arsit and his hundred knights gained the victory. Mars had won. Arsit will marry Emily, announced Theseus. In heaven, among the gods and goddesses, Venus was very angry. I am the queen of love, but I have lost. She looked down on the world and saw Arsit riding on his horse towards Emily to take her as his wife. They looked softly at each other. Women usually love the winner, but then Venus acted. Suddenly, there was an earth tremor. The ground shook under Arsit's horse. The horse was frightened and threw Arsit to the ground. He fell from his saddle and was badly injured. They carried Arsit to his bed and sent for doctors. Emily! Emily! he called. The doctors tried to save him, but he knew that he would die. Palamon and Emily came to his bedside. Oh, Lady Emily, I love you greatly. You are my heart's queen. Take me in your arms and listen to me carefully. I'm sorry now that I quarreled with Palamon, who loves you too. After I die, if you wish to marry, think of him. He looked into Emily's eyes. Then he died. There was a great funeral. Arsid's body was placed in a great fire, just as in his life he had burnt in the fire of love. Emily and Palamon were both very sad. They had lost a husband, a cousin, and a friend. Out of two sorrows, make one perfect joy, said Theseus. Marry each other, as Arsit wished. So Emily and Palamon got married and lived all the rest of their lives in great happiness. And that is the end of my tale, said the knight. Exercise 5 The Miller's Tale Once there was a carpenter who lived in Oxford. He was a very simple man, but he had a beautiful wife called Alison. A young student called Nicholas was a lodger in the carpenter's house. Nicholas and Alison fell in love. They wanted to be alone together, but her husband watched them carefully. I've got an idea, said Nicholas. Nicholas stayed in his room without eating or speaking. What's the matter? asked the carpenter. I've had a terrible dream, said Nicholas. God told me that a flood was coming. It will rain for many weeks and everyone will drown. My beautiful wife, said the carpenter. She will die. How can I save her? You must build three small boats, said Nicholas. Tie them in the roof of the house. Put some food in each boat. Then, tonight, we will climb up and sleep in the boats. When the rain comes, we will be safe. The carpenter believed Nicholas. These Oxford students are very clever, he thought. He made the boats and fixed them in the roof. That night he climbed inside one of the boats. He was very happy. Everyone will die in the flood except for us. We will have the whole world for ourselves. Then he fell asleep. But Nicholas and Alison stayed downstairs. We are alone, said Nicholas. And they began to kiss. Part 3 The Nun's Priest's Tale We need a happy tale, said the host. Something to make us laugh. He saw the nun's priest hiding in the background. Come, sir, tell us a tale. Your horse is thin and sick, but I'm sure that you can tell a good story. I will try to please you, said the priest. Now listen to my tale. Many years ago, in the magic time when all the birds and animals could speak and sing, or so I've heard, there was a poor widow who lived with her two daughters. She had three pigs, 
three cows and a sheep. She was a simple, patient woman who worked hard and thanked God each day. In her farmyard, she kept a cock called Chanticleer. He was well known in the neighbourhood. His crowing was more regular than a clock or a church bell. He was a very handsome bird. He had a red comb on his head, a shining black beak, blue legs, and golden feathers which shone like fire. He was the best and proudest cockerel that has ever lived. There were seven hens in the yard with Chanticleer. The prettiest was called Lady Pertolo. She was polite, friendly, and wise. She had loved Chanticleer since she was a seven-day-old chick, and she was his favourite wife. When the sun rose in the morning, the two birds sang a love song together. It was a golden time. But one day, while he was sleeping in the middle of his seven wives, just before the sun rose, Chanticleer began to scream. <coughs> Darling husband, Pertolo said, what's the matter? Madam, he replied, I have had a terrible dream. I dreamt that a horrible monster wanted to catch me and eat me. He was between yellow and red in colour. There were black tips on his ears and tail. His bright eyes were fixed on me. His rows of teeth were sharp and white. Don't be so afraid, said Pertolo. You have lost my love. I cannot love a coward. All women want strong, independent husbands, not cowards who are afraid of dreams. But the dream is from God, said Chanticleer. Nonsense. Dreams are nothing. All the best writers from the old times agree with me, said the hen. Dreams are the result of eating too much late at night. That is all. Go to the chemist and get some medicine for your stomach. I'll find you some delicious fresh worms to eat. Swallow them alive. After a day or two, you will have no more bad dreams. Trust your wife, dear Chanticleer. Thank you, madam, said the cock, for your advice. But you are wrong. Listen to this story. Then Chanticleer told a story to prove that dreams come true. Once... He began. There were two men who visited another town on a pilgrimage. There was a great crowd of pilgrims, and it was difficult to find a place to stay in the town. So they decided to sleep in separate inns. During the night, one of the men had a dream. His friend was calling out to him. Please help me! Thieves have murdered me! Look at the blood on my clothes and face! They have stolen my money and hidden my body in a dung cart! Tomorrow morning, come to the west gate of the city. You will find me there. Chanticleer paused. It was a horrible dream, full of blood and terror. But the man went back to sleep until the morning. When he woke up, he went to meet his friend at the other inn. But the innkeeper told him that his friend had gone. Quickly, he ran to the west gate of the city. He saw a dung cart leaving the town. So he called the sheriff and asked him to search the cart. Is it necessary to tell you the end of the story, dear Pertolo? They found the murdered man in the cart. Murder will always come into the open. There are many other stories about dreams, my dear wife. They must be true. You can read them in the best books, even the Bible. So don't call me a coward. And now, madam, the sun is rising. Come to me and let us enjoy ourselves together. It is time for love. With these words, Chanticleer forgot the dream and flew down into the yard, and all his hens flew after him. Look at the great sun in the sky, Chanticleer crowed. Cock-a-doodle-doo! It is the beginning of spring, my seven wives. Oh, Madam Pertolo, your beauty fills my heart. When I see how beautiful you are, I am not afraid. Cock-a-doodle-doo! But happiness always ends in sadness. There was a sly fox with black tips on his ears and tail in the yard, 
under the vegetables, hiding like a murderer. He lay there until the middle of the day, waiting for the right time to run out and catch Chanticleer, the fat cock. He fixed his bright eyes on the delicious-looking bird. The cock followed his wife's advice. He ate some worms and walked proudly about the yard. Women are the reason for all the bad luck in the world. At least, that's what certain writers say. Not me. I don't believe it myself. Do you? Pertolo and her sisters were lying in the warm sunlight. They washed their feathers and talked softly about love and food. Chanticleer walked freely and happily in the widow's farmyard, picking up worms and pieces of corn. Then, suddenly, he saw the fox. It was the first time he had ever seen a fox, but he was immediately afraid. Sir, said the fox, why are you running away? I am your great friend and admirer. I came here especially to hear you sing. I knew your father and mother. They also had wonderful voices. They gave me great pleasure, especially when they came to my home. Chanticleer was very happy and proud. The stranger liked his singing. The stupid bird stood on his toes. He pushed up his neck towards the sky, puffed up his chest, closed his eyes and opened his black shining beak. He began to sing, but not for long. It was all over in a second. The fox jumped. He caught Chanticleer by the neck, threw him over his back and ran off towards the forest. It was a terrible thing. Why had Chanticleer flown down into the yard? Why hadn't he stayed on the roof where he was safe? Why had his wife not believed in dreams? This great bird, the husband of seven wives, the handsomest creature in the world, the beautiful singer of morning love songs, is going to die. Greece lost its power. Rome burned and Chanticleer, the cockerel, was stolen by a fox. Pertolo and the hens screamed loudly. The widow ran out of her house and saw the fox. He was running towards the trees with Chanticleer over his shoulder. It was too late to stop him. The widow, her two daughters, her servants with sticks, four dogs, the cook, the maid, even the cows, the sheep and the pigs, all ran after the fox and Chanticleer the cockerel. Ducks flew up out of the pond, quacking. Bees buzzed in the air in a great swarm. The men blew trumpets and shouted like a great army. The earth shook and the sky seemed to fall. Now luck changed. Chanticleer spoke to the fox as they arrived in the forest. The fox's teeth were sharply round his neck, but he could just talk. You are safe now, sir. These stupid people who are running after us will never catch you. Turn round and shout at them, You idiots! I am cleverer than all of you! Did you think you could catch Reynard the fox? <laughs> you can't stop me now. I'll eat this cock for my supper. Then they will respect you, sir. The fox answered, Hmm, yes, you're right. He opened his mouth and spoke. Idiots, I am cleverer than all of you. I'll eat this. But as soon as Reynard opened his mouth, Chanticleer got free. He flew high into the trees and sat on a branch, looking down at the fox. Oh, Chanticleer, called the fox. Why have you flown away? Did I frighten you? I'm sorry, sir. Come down, and I'll explain. I was not going to eat you. I simply wanted to bring you to my home, so that you could sing for me and my children. No, said the cock. I won't be a fool twice. I'll never close my eyes and sing again when there's a fox in the yard. And I'll never open my mouth to speak empty words, said the fox. And that is the end of my tale, said the nun's priest. It's only a story of a fox, a cock, and a hen. 
but we can all learn a lesson from it. It was a good story, agreed the host. Don't you wish you had seven wives like the cock? <laughs> but you are a priest and can have none. Exercise 4. The Dream of Drowning Chanticleer told Pertolo some more stories about dreams. Once, he said, there were two merchants who wanted to cross the sea to France. They waited at the port for several days until the wind was right. They got up early in the morning to begin their journey. But one of the travellers was worried. I had a strange dream, he said. A man was standing by my bed in the middle of the night like a ghost. He told me to wait. If you go on the sea tomorrow, you will be drowned, said this man in my dream. The merchant was very worried. He wanted to delay the journey until it was safe. His friend laughed. <laughs> Look! The sea is calm, the weather is fine, the wind is blowing towards France. I'm not afraid of a dream. I have important business in France. Dreams have no meaning. If you like, you can stay here and lose money. But I shall go to France and become rich. Goodbye, my poor friend. So one of the merchants travelled on the ship and the other one stayed on land. In the middle of the journey there was a sudden accident. The ship went to the bottom of the sea and everyone was drowned. There are many other stories. Men have dreamed that they would be murdered or robbed or tricked. And it always came true. If you knew more history, Pertolo, you wouldn't laugh at my dream. But the sun has risen. It is time for us to enjoy the day, my beautiful wife. Part 4. The Pardoner's Tale One day, the pardoner got drunk and told us all his secrets. I go into the churches and speak to the people. You are all good people. But if anyone has stolen money from his neighbour, or cheated her husband with another man, they will go to hell. <laughs> but if you give me money, I will forgive you in the name of God. Then they all hurry to give me gold. <laughs> Who knows what happens after they die? I don't care if they go to heaven or hell. I just want their money. Even the poor widow has something to give me. I have enough gold to buy a drink of wine and a girl in every town. But even a bad man like me can tell a good story. Listen to my tale. Some years ago, there was a group of young men who lived very badly. They danced and played music all day long. They loved eating and drinking, and afterwards they ran after the women of the town. Above all, they loved gambling. They lived in a time of broken promises and lies and swearing. I am going to tell you about three of these bad young men. One Sunday, they were sitting in a tavern, drinking heavily instead of going to church. They heard a bell ringing. In the street, the people were taking a dead man to the churchyard. One of the men called the servant boy. Go and find out who has died. Make sure you get his name correctly. I can tell you his name, said the boy. He was one of your friends. But suddenly last night he was killed. He was sitting at the table, completely drunk, when a silent thief named Death came and stabbed him in the heart. Then the killer went away without a word. Death kills all of us round here. He has killed a thousand during the plague. Be careful if you meet him, sirs. You see him everywhere you go. That's what my mother told me. It's all I know. The host of the tavern agreed. The boy's right. This year, death killed everyone in a large village near here. Every man, woman and child was killed. The lords and the poor men. Death lives not far away. 
He's always appearing among us. Great God, I'm not afraid, said one of the young men. I'll look for this murderer death in every street. I'll make a promise now. My brothers, let's drink together. We three are one. Death has killed our friends. Now we will kill him before the day is finished. The three men stood up and drank. We, we will, will live and die for one another, they promised. We are all brothers. They went out of the tavern completely drunk and went towards the village where everyone had been killed. If, if we, we catch him, him then, then death is dead. On the way, they met a very old, very poor man. He was wrapped in old clothes so that they could hardly see his face. He greeted them politely. God be with you, my lords. Get out of our way, you old fool, said the leader of the men. Why do you live such a long time? It's time for an old man like you to die. I have been all over the world as far as India, said the old man. But I cannot find a young man who will change his life for mine. So I live as an old man until God decides that I should die. Not even death will take my life. So, like a prisoner in this world, I wait for my freedom. The earth is my mother. I knock on her gate with my stick and cry, Dear mother, let me in. Look at me. I am growing thinner every day. Wrap me in a sheet and take me into my grave. But she refuses to help me. So my face is white and my bones ache. The old man looked at the leader. You spoke very rudely to me just now. That is wrong. It says in the Bible that you should respect an old man with white hair. Don't hurt me, but treat me kindly, so that when you are old yourself, people will respect you. Now let me pass. I must go where I must go. No, old fool. You cannot escape from us so easily, said the leader. You spoke about death a few moments ago. Death has killed all our friends in this place. You are one of his spies. Tell us where he is or you'll pay for it. You are certainly one of Death's gang who planned to kill all the young people. You wicked thief! Well, sirs, if you really want to find Death, follow this crooked path towards that forest. I left him there under a tree. Can you see the oak? He's waiting for you there, I'm sure. He's not afraid of rude young men like you. Now, God be with you and help you to become good. The three men ran down the crooked path towards the tree while the old man stood and watched. Then he continued on his journey. What did they find under the tree? A huge pile of new gold coins. They had never seen so much gold. They immediately forgot all about death when they saw the shining money. It made them very happy. The leader spoke first. Brothers, listen to me carefully. I have a plan. Luck has given us this treasure so that we can live happily and luxuriously for the rest of our lives. We'll spend it all on pleasure. We didn't expect this to be our lucky day. We must take the gold away to my house as soon as possible. Or one of your houses. Brothers, we know that it is our gold. God has given it to us to make us happy. But we mustn't take it by day. People will think we are thieves. They will hang us because of our treasure. We must take it away secretly at night. Therefore, one of us must go to the town to get bread and wine for us all while the others stay and look after the treasure. He must go quickly and secretly. Then, when it is dark, we will carry the gold to one of our houses. 
What do you think? They all agreed. They drew lots, and the youngest ran off to the town to get bread and wine. The other two stayed under the tree with the gold. As soon as the youngest one had gone, the leader talked to the other. You are my true brother. We can help each other. You know that our companion has gone to the town, and here is a huge pile of gold which we will divide among the three of us. But if we divided it between two, that would be better for both of us. Do you agree, friend? That's impossible," said the other. "He knows that we have the gold. If we take it all, how can we explain it to him? Do you agree or not?" asked the first one. "I can tell you my plan in a few words if you are interested. Tell me, I will support you. Well, we are two, and he is only one. We are stronger than him. When he comes back, begin to wrestle with him. He will think it is a game." Then I will come up secretly behind him and stab him in the back while you are fighting. Do the same. Stick your knife in his chest. Then, my dear friend, we will divide all this gold between the two of us like brothers. So these two criminals decided to kill the third one as soon as he returned. But the youngest was also thinking about the gold as he ran to town. The shining coins were beautiful and bright. Oh God! He thought. I would like all this gold for myself. No one would be as happy as I would be then. The devil put an idea in his head. I will poison my two companions. He thought. He did not feel sorry for his friends. He only thought about the gold. Immediately, he went to a chemist in the town. I need some poison to kill rats," he said. "Also, there's an animal which is killing my chickens at home. I must poison it." The chemist replied, "I'll give you the strongest poison that I have. There is nobody, man or animal, that can take this poison and live. The smallest bit is enough to kill a man in a few minutes." The young man took the box of poison and left. He went to a shop in the next street and bought three bottles. He put the poison in two of the bottles, but not in the third. He would drink from that bottle and enjoy the gold after his companions were dead. Then he filled the bottles with wine, and went back to the tree. I am near the end of my story. As they had agreed, the two other men killed the youngest one as soon as he returned with the wine. Then they sat down. Now let's sit and drink before we bury his body. The leader took one of the bottles, drank, and passed it to his friend, who also drank. It was the poisoned wine. In a few minutes, all three were on the ground under the tree, ready for the rats and worms to eat them. They had found death. Exercise four: The Merchant's Tale. Once there was a rich old knight who had a beautiful young wife. They were called January and May. January was very jealous of his wife and watched her very carefully. But January's servant Damien sent her secret love letters. May wanted to meet Damien alone, but it was difficult with such a jealous husband. One day, January woke up and could not see. He was blind. He became more and more jealous because he couldn't watch his wife. All day and all night, he held May's hand. It was even more difficult than before to meet Damien. May, however, made a plan to trick her old blind husband. She led him into the garden. Damien had climbed a tree and was sitting in the branches. Darling husband, said May, help me to climb into the tree. There are some delicious pears. I will bring you one. January agreed. May stood on his back and climbed into the tree above his head. At last, she was free. May and Damien kissed passionately among the green leaves and the golden fruit.
but the gods were watching. They decided to help January. They gave him back his sight. He could see again. And the first thing he saw was his young wife kissing his servant in the pear tree. Wife! He shouted angrily. What are you doing? May thought quickly. A doctor told me, she said, that the only way to help you to see again was to fight with a young man in a tree. It's magic. I did it to help you, darling. But you weren't fighting. You were kissing, said January. Your eyes are not so good yet. You made a mistake. Of course I wasn't kissing that young man, she answered. She came down from the tree and kissed him while Damien escaped. Everything is all right, she said. You can see again my darling husband, and we have some delicious pears for our supper. Part 5 The Wife of Bath's Tale A long time ago, when King Arthur ruled the land, there was a great knight who loved all the pleasures of life. But one day, a lady of the court told the king that the knight had attacked her. Arthur was very angry and said that the knight must die. Cut off his head! But the queen and her ladies asked Arthur to give the knight to them for punishment. To please his queen, Arthur agreed. The queen sent for the knight. I and my ladies have the power to let you live or die, she said. You will live only if you can answer this question. What is it that women most desire? If you cannot tell us at this moment, you may go away for a year and a day to find the answer. But if you return without the answer, remember this. The axe is sharp. The knight was very unhappy, but he had no choice. He said goodbye to the queen and rode away. He travelled through the whole country, from coast to coast, looking for the answer. He knocked on every door. What is it that women most desire? He asked, but he could not find two people who agreed. Women want to be rich. No, they want a good reputation. No, they want pleasure. They want fine clothes. They want a life of love with many husbands. Women want to be spoilt and flattered. Women want freedom with nobody to criticise them. Women want people to say that they can keep a secret. That is nonsense, of course. No woman can keep a secret. Do you remember the ancient tale of King Midas? Midas grew a splendid pair of donkey's ears under his long hair. Nobody knew except his wife. Midas loved her and made her promise that she wouldn't tell anyone about his ears. Of course she promised, but because she was a woman, it was difficult to keep the secret. It wanted to fly out of her mouth. I must tell somebody, she thought. So she ran down to the lake, her heart on fire. She lay down among the river grasses and whispered the secret to the water. My husband has a pair of donkey's ears. The wind spread the secret through the whole country. We women are all like that. Well, the knight realised that he would never find the answer. He felt sad and hopeless. The year had finished, and this was the day when he had to return to the queen. As he was riding sadly back to the court through the forest... He suddenly saw 24 beautiful women dancing on the green grass. Perhaps they know the answer, he thought. He approached them, but as he did so, they vanished from his sight. It had been a magic vision. Remember that in the days of King Arthur, there were still fairies in the world. There was no living thing in the forest except an old woman sitting on the grass where they had danced. She was the ugliest, most horrible creature he had ever seen. This ugly hag stood up and said, Sir Knight, there is no path here. Tell me, 
What are you looking for? Perhaps I can help. We old people know many things. Old lady, I will die today unless I can answer this question. What is it that women most desire? If you can tell me, I'll pay you well. Give me your hand, said the Ag. Promise me that if I give you the true answer, you will do anything that I ask. I promise. Agreed, the knight. Then your life is safe. The queen herself will agree with my answer. The proudest lady that ever wore beautiful clothes will admit that I am right. Let me teach you the answer. And the old woman whispered in his ear. When they came to the queen's court, the knight said, I am ready to give my answer. The queen and all her ladies were there. There were single women and wives and many widows who were the wisest of all. The knight was the only man surrounded by women. Speak, said the queen, who sat like a judge. Silence, everyone. Listen to the knight. The knight spoke loudly so that all the ladies could hear. My sweet queen, he said, women desire to have power over their husbands. This is your greatest desire. Kill me if you like, but this is the true answer. There was no woman in the court, not a girl or a wife or a widow who disagreed with him. You may keep your life, said the queen. At that moment, the old hag jumped up and spoke. Oh, powerful queen, she said. Before you go, give me justice. I taught the knight how to answer. In return, he said that he would do whatever I asked him. Therefore, before this court, I ask you, sir knight, to marry me. I have saved your life. Now do this for me. The knight answered unhappily. I know that I promised you this, but please change your request. I will give you everything I have, but let my body be mine. No, I am ugly and old and poor, but I do not want gold or land or luxuries. I want to be your wife, and more than that, I want to be your love. My love? That is impossible. But the knight could not escape. He married the hag secretly next day and hid himself for the rest of the day. There was no dancing, no singing or eating and drinking at their wedding. That night he lay in bed with her. He turned to and fro like someone with a bad dream, keeping as far away from her as possible. His old wife lay there smiling. Dear husband, does every one of King Arthur's knights behave like this with his bride? I am your own sweet wife. I have saved your life. I have never done anything bad to you. Why do you behave like this on our first night together? Tell me the problem and I will make it right. Make it right? No. <laughs> Impossible. You are so ugly, so old, and you come from such a low family that I don't want to be near you. Is that all? If you treat me well, I can make this right in three short days. But why do you worry about my family? Don't you know that true gentlewomen and true gentlemen are the ones who do good things? Lords and ladies can become thieves and murderers and cheats. But a poor man or woman can be a true gentle person if he or she loves God and other human beings. Then you say that I am poor. There is nothing wrong in that. Jesus himself chose to live as a poor man. I think that the poor man is rich even if he has no shirt.
The poor man can always find a song to sing. He is not afraid of thieves. He loves God. He knows that his friends love him for himself and not for his money. It is good to be poor, I think. Lastly, you said that I am old and ugly. But you know that all the best writers tell us to respect old people. And if I'm ugly, you needn't be afraid that I will cheat you with another man. But I know what men like. I will give you great pleasure. Now, choose one of these two things. You can have me old and ugly until I die. I will be a true wife to you and never upset you as long as I live. Or you can have me young and beautiful. But then men will visit your house while you are away because I am so beautiful. Now choose. Which do you want? The knight thought about this for a long time. It made him very unhappy. At last he spoke. My lady and my love, my darling wife, I put myself in your power. Choose yourself. You're wise enough to know which way is the best for you and for me. I don't care what you decide. If you are pleased, then I am also happy. Are you really giving me the power to choose? Will you do as I say? Yes, wife. It is best. Then kiss me. We'll stop being angry with each other. I'll be both things to you. I mean that I'll be young and beautiful, but also a true wife. I'll be the best wife that anyone has ever had in the history of the world. If tomorrow, when the sun is shining, I am not as beautiful as any queen in the east or west, then kill me if you like. Take the curtain from the window. It is morning already, husband. Look at me. When the knight looked at her, he saw that she really was young and beautiful. He caught her in his arms and gave her a thousand kisses. She did everything she could to please him. So they lived in perfect joy. Please, God, send all of us women young, strong, handsome husbands who will do anything for our love. And if any men won't give women what they most desire, the power over their husbands, let God strike them dead. Exercise 5. The Wife of Bath My lords, this is the story of my life. Since I was twelve years old, I have had five husbands, all married in church. Some people say you should only marry once, but I don't agree. I'm looking forward to the sixth husband. I'm an expert in life and love. You can read about things in books, but real knowledge comes from experience. And I've had more experience than any of you. My first three husbands were rich and old. I made them work for me. I spent their money. I stopped them from looking at other women and, before they died, I made them give me all their land and gold. Money is the most important thing in life, I believe. Everything is for sale. But my fourth husband was different. He liked drinking and dancing. He had a girlfriend that made me angry, but I got my revenge. I made him pay for it. I shouted at him, I hit him, I flirted with other men. In the end, he became sick because of me, his terrible wife. I went on a holy pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and when I came back, he was dead. I tell you, I didn't spend a lot of money on his funeral. <laughs> I spend money on the dead. I've enjoyed my life. I've had a world of love. And now that I'm older, although I've lost my good looks... I still know how to get a man. Maybe I'll marry one of you. Part 6. The Franklin's Tale I am a simple man, said the Franklin. I haven't read many books, but I will tell my story simply and clearly. 
A long time ago, in Brittany, there was a knight who loved a lady. She was one of the most beautiful women under the sun, and came from a noble family. He was afraid to speak to her, but at last he asked her to marry him. She knew how much he loved her, and decided to accept him as her husband and her lord. In return, he promised that he would never use his power against her, but would always do what she wanted. He would never forget that he was her lover, as well as her husband. Sir, she said, "You have given me everything I want from marriage, love, and independence. I will be your true wife until I die. My heart is yours." This is the best kind of marriage. Love will not be limited by power. When one person tries to control the other, the god of love beats his wings and farewell. He is gone. Women want to be free, not to be servants, and men are the same. So the lady took the knight as her servant in love, and her lord in marriage. If you are not married, you can't imagine the happiness that a wife and husband can enjoy. Soon, however, the knight, whose name was Arvergus, had to go to England to fight. He stayed there for two years. His wife, whose name was Dorigen, loved her husband as much as she loved her own life. While he was away, she cried and sighed and lost her appetite. She could not sleep and paid no attention to the world. Arvergus sent her letters, telling her how much he loved her. At last, she began to recover. She drove away her dark fantasy. Her castle was on the coast, next to the sea. Dorigen often walked with her friends along the cliff top. But when she saw the ships on the sea, she began to cry. If one of these ships brought home my lord, then my heart would be happy. There were terrible black rocks in the sea. Her heart trembled with fear. God. Why did you make these black rocks and put them here in the sea? They are no good for anything. They destroy ships. Thousands of men have died at sea. It kills my heart to look at them. One morning in May, her friends had a party for her. They wanted to make her happy. They went to a garden full of flowers with their bright colours and sweet perfumes, a little paradise. After dinner, they began to dance and sing, but Dorigen stayed alone. She could not be happy without Arvergus. At this party, there was one of her neighbours, a young squire named Aurelius. He was as bright and handsome as May itself. He was young, strong, honest, rich, and wise, a perfect lover. He had loved Dorigen secretly for two years. But had never told her. He had written many songs and poems about a beautiful lady that he loved hopelessly, but she herself had no idea that she was the lady. Aurelius decided that the time had come to open his heart. Madam, my heart is breaking. You can kill me or save my life with one word. I lie here at your feet. Give me your sweet love, or I will die. What are you saying? Said Dorigen. I will never be an untrue wife. Take this as my final answer. But, after this, she added as a joke, Aurelius, I would give you my love if you could remove the black rocks from the sea. If you can do that, I'll love you more than any other man. Is there no other way to win your love? No, by God. Forget this stupid idea. Why do you want another man's wife, Madam? Said Aurelius. It is impossible to remove the rocks, so I will die for your love. With these words, he left her. At his house, he shivered with cold. His heart was ice. He got down on his knees and spoke to the gods. Apollo, god of the sun, help me. Your sister, the goddess of the moon, has power over the seas and rivers. Ask her to make a great flood which covers the black rocks. 
Then I can go to my lady and say, Look, I have won your love. With those words, Aurelius fell on the floor. Luckily, his brother found him and carried him to bed. Now it is time for me to tell you about Arvarigus. He came back from the wars after he had won many battles. Dorigen, you are so happy now. Your husband is in your arms. He loves you better than his own life and never imagines that another man has spoken to you about love. Aurelius was lovesick for two years. He stayed in bed and told no one about his desire for Dorigen except his brother. His brother was very worried. How can I help Aurelius? he asked himself. I remember that when I was in the city of Orléans, I saw a secret book. There are students of magic who can make a river flow inside a house or a lion appear at a dance. They can make people see a castle suddenly appear and then, when they wish, it disappears again. So his brother told Aurelius about the book. Aurelius immediately decided to go to Orléans with him. As they came near the city, a young man met him. I know why you are here, he said. I am the magician who can help you. This man took the brothers to his house and showed them fantastic things. Knights fought a great battle in front of their eyes. Then Aurelius saw Dorigen dancing and went to join her. The magician clapped his hands. Everything disappeared. The magician promised to make all the black rocks disappear from the coast of Brittany. But you must pay me a thousand pounds. Nothing less. Aurelius laughed. <laughs> I would give you the round world if you could help me win the love of Dorigen. I promise to pay you. Next day, the brothers and the magician rode back to the coast. It was December, the beginning of winter when all the green had disappeared from the world. There was frost and rain and snow. Please act quickly, begged Aurelius. If I have to wait longer, I will kill myself for love. The magician was sorry for him and worked day and night. He took out his magic books and chose the best time for his trick. The moon and stars were in the right place in the sky. Then, by magic, the rocks became invisible. No one could see them. Aurelius went to the cliff and looked. Then he fell at the magician's feet. Thank you, my lord, and thank you, Lady Venus. He went quickly to find Dorigen. My true lady, he began, you almost killed me when you did not give me your love. But now remember your promise and do not murder me. I have done what you wanted. The black rocks have gone. Go and look. Then, if you decide to be true to your promise, come to me at the garden. We will be lovers there. Dorigen lost all the colour from her face. I have been tricked. I never imagined that it would be possible to remove the rocks. She went home and cried for two <laughs> days without stopping. Avarigus was in another town, so she had no one to help her. I must choose between breaking my promise to Aurelius or being an untrue wife. There is only one solution. Many famous women in history have killed themselves to escape from men who tried to take their love. I, I will be one of them. On the third day, however, Averigus came home. Why are you crying, my darling wife? He asked her. She told him everything. Averigus was not angry, but spoke softly to her. My dear wife, I cannot ask you to break your promise. My love for you tells me that you must be true. Truth is the highest thing in a person's life. Then he suddenly began to cry. <laughs> but never speak to anyone about this thing after you have done it. <laughs> now get ready to go to Aurelius. Be happy. No one must see what is happening. Perhaps you think that he was stupid to put his wife in such danger. But listen to the end of my story. Then decide. Dorigen met Aurelius in the street as she was going to the garden to keep her promise. Where are you going? he asked, his face bright and happy. She told him everything. Aurelius was shocked. 
he realized how much Averagus loved Dorigen. He decided it was better to forget his love than to make her love him against her will. Madam, tell your lord Averagus that I understand his love for you. I will not come between his love and you. I agree to forget all your promises. Madam, you are the best and truest wife I have ever known. Your husband has been generous, and I will be generous also. Dorigen went down on her knees and thanked him. Then she returned to Averagus and told him what had happened. They were happy for the rest of their lives and lived like a king and queen of love. Aurelius realized that he had lost everything. I must pay the magician a thousand pounds. I must sell my house and all my land. But I must keep my promise. Sadly, he went to the magician. I can pay you five hundred pounds, he said. Please give me time to pay the rest. Didn't I keep my promise to you? asked the magician. Yes, you did, replied Aurelius. And didn't you enjoy the love of your lady because of my magic? No, no. Tell me the reason, if you can. She wanted to kill herself. But her husband loved her so much that he wanted her to be true to her promise. When I heard this, I sent her back to him. My dear friend, you have all done well. He is a knight and he was generous. You are a squire and you were generous. I am a philosopher and I will be generous. I don't want any money for all my work. So now, goodbye. The Franklin turned to the other pilgrims. My lords, who is the best, most generous gentleman? What do you think? Exercise 4. The Book Against Women Let me tell you about my last husband, the only one I truly loved. I was 40 and he was 20. I met him at my grandmother's house. His name was Jankin and he had been a student at Oxford. We went to the fields together while my husband was in London. Jankin, I said, if my husband dies, I want you for my next one. In fact, Jankin helped to carry my husband to his grave. A month later, we got married. At first, we were happy, but then he began to beat me. He said that he hated women. The problem was a book. It was a book against women. It was a very big book with hundreds of stories about bad women. Eve, who had given Adam the apple in paradise. Cleopatra, who had destroyed Mark Antony. Wives who had murdered their husbands. Jankin read this book every night by the fire. At last I had had enough. I jumped up and tore three pages out of the book. Then I hit him so that he fell backwards into the fire. Immediately, like an angry lion, he picked up the enormous heavy book. He hit me over the head with it. Bang! That's why I'm deaf in my left ear. Well, I knew what to do. I lay still on the floor as if I were dead. He thought he had killed me. At last I opened my eyes. Did you want to murder me for my gold, I asked. Dearest love, he said, I will never hit you again. Forgive me. Then I sat up and kissed him. After that, he let me do as I wanted, and I was a true wife to him. But what about the book? I made him burn it in the fire. A book like that can destroy a marriage. 